Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, final episode of season two of A Conversation with Comic Tam. We're on episode 19 now. Um, this has been a great season, and, and we've got a really good uh, bonus episode, really, here to, to end this season. Um, I've got Philip Van Nedervelder here today, uh, who is the founder of eSpaces and also the founder of many other different enterprises that I want to try and um, get some more information about today. Uh, and also just sort of explore his background and, and sort of uh, how he got to, to where he is and what his plans for the future are, which sound very interesting and, you know, right to par street for, for, you know, our interest in space, space exploration and all things astronomical. So thanks for joining me today, Philip. Um, I suppose where we could begin is, you know, how did you get to to the to where you are now in, in a sense, in sort of a, a short, you know, uh, um, biography, you could say. Um. So hello everybody, and thank you for having me, Comitan. My short biography, in the context of your uh, series. I have been a space buff for as long as I can remember. Yeah. I have a photograph uh, where my father is holding me on his uh, arm uh, when I'm about two years old, and he's pointing at a black and white television set where Neil Armstrong is uh, setting foot on the moon. And uh, my, I don't remember that event, I was too young, but uh, my father uh, kept reminding me that uh, he made sure that I was an eyewitness in real time, live, of that historical event via television. And so um, he uh, deserves all the credit for uh, raising me as someone keenly interested in everything related to space flight. And he gave me his collection of big pictorial magazines that were uh, documenting the uh, Apollo space flights in, in glorious technicolor detail and um, fo very fond memories of my youth where I was sitting in a little corner uh, leafing through those you know big eyed and, and wanting to be an astronaut of course and um, so that also very naturally extended to an interest uh, in astronomy. And so when I was 12, the first th chance I got to make a decision for myself with regard to what I was doing with my free time, I switched from the Boy Scouts to the local uh, space and astronomy club. Uh, in the city, in the city of Alst, where I was born, which is a city halfway, literally halfway, exactly halfway between Brussels and Ghent in Flanders, Belgium. And so um, that broadened to an interest in computers, inevitably. Um, so that space and astronomy club was uh, inevitably a collection of local geeks and nerds. And so um, I, I learned astronomy, amateur astronomy, but still, and, um, and space flight. And um, so that was a, a real education to me and pure bliss intellectually, a flowering intellectually, I, I should also say. So my, my interest in space flight broadened to an interest in astronomy and then computers because it was the early days of personal computers and then also uh, science fiction, of course, and philosophy and STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, all of that good stuff. Yeah. Um, next, I um, went to university and there um, you might have thought that with that background so far that I would go and do some kind of engineering or maybe uh, uh, physics or so. And uh, I did not. I, um, well, I won't go into the details here, but I, uh, at age 12, I became a precocious journalist uh, because 
um, I was able to get an interview with uh, Apollo 13 astronaut Fred Hayes uh, at age, oh, I, I must have been 12 at the time of the interview. And so in my still not fully fledged English, I interviewed uh, Fred Hayes and he was, he was just wonderful. And um, I was asked to publish, to write and publish a report of this interview in a national magazine uh, for the, the school system that I was in. Um, and I did. And so my first published article uh, was uh, at age uh, 13 or so, and already fully about space flight. And then I continued that throughout my secondary education, culminating before uh, my, the end of my secondary education with an article in English uh, with a mention on the cover of Astronomy magazine. And that was in May, 1986. And so that's not too shabby for a, uh, a kid from Flanders who is not a native English speaker to have a, an article published worldwide in color uh, in English uh, before he turned 18. And so, and that article, by the way, was an overview of European space flight at that time. Right. And so that kind of set me up for a career path in media as a journalist, as a reporter, as a et cetera. And so I chose to go and do communication science. Uh, which is one of the de um, departments of the humanities, uh, human uh, social sciences. And um, I, in, in hindsight, I timed that, or the universe timed that exactly right by virtue of um, my arriving there and being the very first to be taught about interactive multimedia and hypermedia. So it was brand new at the time, and uh, we got the first course. And uh, in that course, interactive multimedia, there was also, to my delight, uh, a, an entire chapter on virtual reality, which was you know, being just introduced uh, back then. And so uh, that's what I did at university. I, uh, I got a master's degree in communication science. And uh, because I couldn't stop, I'd also did a postgraduate degree in media and information science. So turning my humanities degree into something very technical, because I was already, uh, as an, uh, an entrepreneur that couldn't be held back, I was already moonlighting as a programmer uh, of databases on uh, a... Um, a, an Amstrad PCW uh, computer, et cetera. So I was earning some money. I paid for my own university the, the last two years uh, myself by earning money as a teacher of uh, software, um, productivity software packages like similar to Office um, and, uh, and programming. And so I... I, I was really where I hoped and wanted to be. Um, where I could do all of the academic training to launch a career as an entrepreneur, um, because I, I knew already from what I had done during my secondary education, which included the founding, again at age 12 or 13, of my first organization. Uh, because in Belgium at that time, a 12-year-old could not be the owner of a for-profit company, I founded a non-profit. Uh, so, and, and the, the name of it was the Belgian Space Information Center. And so uh, during my secondary education, um, I developed, I, I grew, I built what I think to, by the end, when I went to university, I had built up the richest space documentation center of the Low Countries. Um, and um, so thousands of books, models, posters, uh, space artifacts, patches, name it. And uh, so 
being a, a, a starter of organizations and an entrepreneur, uh, after doing my military service, I, I very quickly uh, set up shop myself as a uh, consultant in the design of uh, interactive hypermedia and multimedia, which very soon uh, turned into becoming a developer of virtual reality environments. And so in uh, this is becoming quite uh, elaborate as a biography, but I, I think it sets up the rest of the conversation beautifully. So, so what I did uh, is in 1991, I cut my teeth in as a virtual reality professional on my very first project in virtual reality, which was creating cyberspace. And so uh, infused and driven really by the science fiction visions of the 1980s, uh, in particular, uh, True Names by Werner Vinge, and then um, Neuromancer uh, and Count Zero by William Gibson, where he coined the word cyberspace. Uh, and then later uh, in the, that was in the early 90s, I believe, Neil Stevenson with uh, Snow Crash, where he coined the word metaverse. Uh, so I, in 1991, I became uh, a participant in a project based out of Adelaide in Australia, uh, that the aim of which was to create a multi-user uh, virtual world, um, massively multi-user, uh, that could be a, the first implementation of the visions of cyberspace and metaverse uh, from science fiction. And so fast forward, well, maybe not that fast, but um, after 1991, um, I, I soon founded my own company um, and uh, or rather started working as um, my own VR company. And then we, we incorporated a bit later details that I won't go into here. Um, but in um, 1993, um, we started doing uh, work, uh, uh, professional work uh, for clients. And um, that's, that's one I think I should, uh, that bears mentioning. Uh, and I'm, as you can hear, uh, proud of this one that's, that I'm describing now, which is a project that we did in 1992 and 1993 for Ericsson Business Networks. Ericsson at that time was a, uh, a very big um, company, uh, famous for its uh, very small um, phones and mobile phones. And um, they wanted to have a working prototype of what the future, the, the 3D future of online e-commerce would be, electronic commerce online. And so we created uh, a, a completely software-based working prototype uh, that we called CyberTown. And basically it's a very simplistic uh, 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 town marketplace uh, with a fountain and uh, circled uh, around the marketplace, you'd have a travel agency, you'd have an art store, you'd have a bank, etc. All of this in, in uh, virtual reality without using headsets, uh, just on your screen, flat screen VR. And so that was a, a working prototype of a multi-user virtual world that would, uh, that showed how people would be shopping uh, and ordering trips, et cetera, online in virtual reality. And th the reason why I'm proud of that one is that it's 1993. This is before the World Wide Web. Yes. Because the World Wide Web only really started to come into its own in 1994 uh, and 1995. And so um, I uh, formally incorporated eSpaces, which is the name of my VR studio, in 1996, and then we went on to do hundreds of um, multi-user virtual world projects, uh, including, by the way, uh, one for NASA. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
And so we won awards um, at various uh, industry conferences, et cetera, and, and other accolades. And um, th that's, a, that's a storied history in, uh, in itself. Mm. Uh, but we, we are still uh, doing that. eSpaces is still going strong. And to our knowledge, we are the world's oldest continuously operated virtual reality studio on planet Earth and probably in the solar system as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I've got so many questions. <laughs> um, but I suppose the, the most important ones for me really are, I suppose, about... I, I, how you identify, but also what you believe and also your experiences. Because if you don't know about me, I, I'm the founder of Astronism, which is this sort of philosophy, new religious movement, uh, belief system, uh, whatever you want to call it. And so I'm interested particularly in what people believe about outer space and how that affects their lives. So um, the first question is for me um, is sort of, how do you identify with space? Do you call yourself a transhumanist? Do you call yourself um, a cosmist? Um, so that's the first question. And then the second question is, I, I've experienced um, a connection to space. I call it just, you know, a connection. A, a, I've had experiences just looking up at space, an astronomical phenomena since I was about 15. And those things, those experiences have influenced my life from then on uh, and what I do. And, and, and every day I have a, I feel I have a relationship really. And I know that sounds funny, but it, it, it's, it is true. I do have a sort of, my, my disposition seems to be based on the, 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 the events that are taking place up there. And, and, and I don't know, I just have this connection with space. So I just wanted to know, have you ever felt anything in a deeper way about space, or are you more sort of, uh, you know, um, engineering and science, and um, not to say that those things you, you can can't be both, but sometimes you, you know um, people who are more into sort of the practical elements of space are not as into the sort of deeper philosophical emotional parts of space, uh, which is certainly what I am. Uh, so two questions there for you. <laughs> Okay, so my, how I self-identify when it comes to the cosmos yes. is deeply rooted in my emotional education when I was a small child. Yes. So it started with enormous awe yeah. for, for the cosmos, for uh, the universe, and uh, awe also for mankind's ability to dip a toe into that uh, universe, as I described, uh, you know, with my father. Yeah. Now, I am a, in many ways, I try to be something of a bridge between fields and um, professionally, uh, and depending on the audience that I'm in front of, I, I, em I emphasize one thing or one part and de-emphasize the other. Yeah. So um, with, with many of the audiences that I am in front of, uh, it doesn't play very well to be very touchy-feely, spiritual, and all of that. So... For, for that audience, I overemphasize the engineering, the technical, the practical, the all of that. Um, so, but in, in cases like this one, uh, Komitan, I, I'm happy to, um, to show a bit more uh, of the emotional and spiritual side. So my father, uh, before he begat me, was a Cistercian monk uh, with full vows. And um, so I was raised a very devout Roman Catholic. Yeah. And um, uh, it's not because he defrocked, met my mother and begat me and my brother, 
that he lost his uh, faith, uh, not at all. Uh, he, he just didn't have the vocation for a monastic life. Yeah. Um, my father remained very much a, a, a uh, in, in religious terms, a, a lay person mystic. And um, he, he, he uh, introduced me to the charismatic movement. Um, that's, you know, within the Roman Catholic Church, a movement uh, very much uh, emphasizing the emotional connection with the divine. And uh, I went to meetings where they were doing speaking in tongues and, and stuff like that. And um, so my father also wrote a, a treatise on the, uh, it's a meditation really on the Holy Trinity by um, Rublov, uh, the, the Russian painter of icons, and he has a beautiful icon uh, showing the Holy Trinity. So um, now that might suggest that I am still a uh, deeply religious person, that is not the case. Um, I, I did uh, commit apostasy, and I am no longer a uh, Roman Catholic. Um, I, I, I didn't formally apostatize yet, but um, I, I did abandon uh, my, the faith that I was given uh, in, a, in, in a personal God and all of that. And I became first a um, even militant atheist. And then I came to my senses because I noticed that uh, militant atheists uh, were committing the same error in my not always so humble opinion of being uh, excessively confident in them being right. And so what I, what had, one of the things that had, um, disillusioned me and disenchanted me from um, a monotheistic religion like Roman Catholicism was the um, the arrogant certitude of uh, priests, uh, the priesthood and and dogmaticians in them being right and and all their uh, claims being divine revelation in holy writ, etc. and here I was with militant atheists being just as arrogantly certain that they were right, that there is no God. And so um, after I came to my senses, I became what I call a, um, a mystical agnostic. And so that's, that's somebody, um, I define it as somebody who uh, has the courage of uh, saying openly that I don't know. I am not sure. I, I, I do not peddle in certainties. I can offer you only doubts and skepticism. And so I don't know whether there is a deity. Um, I'm not going to claim that there isn't. Um, my suspicion is that there isn't. Uh, and so I, I am partial to this campaign where they said, you know, there probably is no God. Uh, that's the right way, uh, and that's what I think as well. There probably is no God, but I'm not going to claim that I know with certainty uh, those things. And so um, I'm, I'm not going to be arrogantly certain in your face. Uh, and um, and so and the mystical part of mystical agnosticism means that I remain open to um, realities that science has not yet yeah. probed or has not yet uh, illuminated. Uh, and so I don't believe there is a metaphysical. I don't think there is uh, something outside of nature. I think everything is nature, um, including what, um, what historically uh, pseudosciences and religions have uh, claimed to be supernatural. Um, so I'm in that sense, I'm a, a naturalist. Everything is nature and we are of nature. And so you, you cannot not be natural because you are in and of nature. And so I, um, that's what, that, that's how I identify. Now, let me 
circle back or let, let me tie that back to the cosmos. So my father, when I was age 12, uh, gifted me uh, a set of books written by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, uh, a, uh, a French Jesuit um, who was ostracized by the uh, Roman um, uh, hierarchy in, in, uh, of the Roman uh, church. He was admonished, you know, you shouldn't be saying the, or writing or publishing what you're writing. But uh, Pierre Théard de Chardin what was another epiphany or revelation for me because here is a man um, with a um, scientific attitude. Um, he was a paleontologist, I believe, by, uh, by uh, training and education uh, academically. And so he posited the, uh, a, an evolutionary process that is continuing and that uh, right now in his view, uh, not all, by the way, this view is not completely unique to him, although his formulation is. And basically he posited that we are now uh, in the early stages of what is known as the no genesis, uh, the creation of the no sphere, that is the realm of the mind. And he saw the advent of telecommunication satellites and he, he, he had passed away before the internet, but uh, everything that we've seen, the, the personal computer, the internet, satellite telecommunication, mobile phones, et cetera, he sees as a um, materialization, a realization of spirit, of mind. Uh, and of course he, he couches that in, in Christian terms um, and then he posits that as a phase towards what he called Christogenesis, which is the generation, the creation of the Christ, uh, which of course is a Christian uh, notion. And his idea was that we are a part of a process where mankind and the universe becomes God. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, the and this goes back to other philosophical schools like the Exitus Reditus school of ancient uh, Roman times uh, and Hegel, etc. Where and but also Buddhism or or Hinduism, where the idea was that uh, in the beginning uh, the deity Brahman uh, disseminates himself or spreads himself into a, a, a gazillion. Uh, small pieces which are all souls and then the entire universe is a long process of reintegration of all of those things into so th that's the that's the same thing but but in other uh, words of what Pierre Théard de Chardin was positing and that I was reading at age 12 and I loved it and so um but uh, soon thereafter, there was a very technical uh, core online television course in astronomy uh, uh, by the Dutch uh, television uh, networks. And um, I followed that. So that was a grounding back to pure science. And then, um, but there was also, and this is important emotionally and spiritually, there was the television series Cosmos by Carl Sagan which made an indelible, huge impression on me to this day, uh, because I was watching this with rapt attention, uh, delighted, uh, getting intellectual highs almost with every episode, where he was showing in with such grace and elegance the beauty of the universe and the cosmos. And he made me fall in love all over again with astronomy and space flight and uh, the, the notion of space settlement, et cetera, and reconnected me viscerally with this, um, with the, the overpowering uh, sense of awe and, and marvel and wonder at, at the universe. So Carl Sagan, we miss you so much. And, um, yeah. and so, that, that was very formative uh, for me. And um, 
let me tie it back now to how I self-identify today yes. uh, to answer your question. So um, in the, over the course of my secondary education, I became in many ways an ardent proponent of the space settlement movement. Um, I, I was, you know, writing about it. I was uh, doing the Belgian Space Information Center, uh, et cetera. And so I was driven very powerfully uh, with regard to space and astronomy by a desire and a sense also that uh, Tsiolkovsky was so right, you know, um, Earth is a beautiful cradle for mankind, but one cannot stay in one's cradle uh, for one's entire life. So, and, and that is beautifully retold today by Elon Musk, who says, you know, mankind's destiny is to become a multiplanetary uh, civilization. And I, I couldn't agree more and more power to Elon for exactly that. And so in that sense, I am uh, a Russian or I am partial and I feel kinship with the Russian cosmist uh, movement. I, I see the actual physical settlement of space as a realization of not only the vision of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, but also of Tsiolkovsky and the Russian cosmists. And, and so in that sense, I, I do see the, the space settlement movement um, as, as a, a way to realize those philosophical and spiritual uh, visions. Another way that I'm doing that, uh, and this is interestingly how in one's life things can tie together in, in unexpected ways, so with my virtual reality work uh, and focusing on um, multi-user virtual worlds from the beginning, from 1991, I, it's all coming full circle now with the creation of, this is the big project I'm working on right now of a metaverse. Now, what is a metaverse? A metaverse as, um, it was a word coined by Neil Stevenson. Uh, meta is a little prefix from ancient Greek that means beyond or on top of, and um, like metaphor, meta, etc. And so a metaverse is a, a universe on top of the physical universe. So uh, it is a shared immaterial plane of existence. Uh, when, when, if you want spiritual references, the astral plane uh, that uh, is posited by ancient schools of uh, thought and spirituality, including Hindu, etc. Uh, the, the astral plane is, guess what? A shared immaterial plane of existence. But I'm all about making those visions from science fiction and spirituality um, realities, uh, tangible, physical, daily realities. And that is how, on the one hand, with the space settlement movement, you know, I, uh, I, I aim to be helpful in making that a reality. And we can go into uh, specifics and examples of what I'm doing on that front. But I'm also doing it from the other side by the, uh, the notion of a shared immaterial plane of existence is the, um, I'm realizing that in the form of a virtual reality metaverse. And so the metaverse that we are building is a, an, uh, uh, an immaterial virtual realm where you can um, go and live, work and play. So it's a general purpose, um, virtual reality, multi, massively multi-user uh, environment and space and world where you can go and exist and, and basically have a, a richer life, a, a fuller life, a more complete life by adding this additional immaterial plane of existence to the physical plane of existence that you already are in. And uh, you can go and do there anything you want the core value proposition of uh, the metaverse that I'm building 
is uh, the ability to earn a real living in a virtual world. Mm. And so people will go there and stay there and return there because it offers them a platform to earn a real living from the safety of their home. And you see uh, how that is the physical, uh, technological realization of uh, the, the noosphere uh, of Pierre Théard de Chardin, but also of this deeply ancient notion of a shared immaterial plane of existence. And so virtual reality, or what I'm doing with metaverses and building a metaverse is the realization of, of those ancient, deeply ancient notions and the space settlement movement and settling the moon and Mars and venturing out into the cosmos and uh, in the long run, uh, exploring and settling interstellar space um, is the, the physical actual realization of this noosphere and these ancient visions from Russian cosmists. And that's what, I'm, that's what I fancy that my, uh, that an important, a hugely important part of my life is about Cometan. It is about the realization in tangible, uh, genuine um, realities for, for people of, uh, of those science fiction or deeply ancient uh, spiritual visions. I see all of this as a huge convergence uh, where the, the deeply ancient notions are catching up or, or rather science fiction is catching up with those deeply ancient notions. And then yours truly is a small cog um, that is doing its bit and being instrumental in making those deeply ancient visions and notions actual realities. Do you, do you um, so I, I did a article about two years ago, uh, ago now that, that half of the people who read it sort of understood it and then the other part didn't and it was titled space exploration should be a religious endeavor and I think I titled that right because it got people's attention um but also i think a lot of people misunderstood it what i meant to say by that is that i think space exploration needs to have the same zeal that that people and, and belief that that uh, in in the the fruits of space exploration that of what that can bring about uh, as as religion has had as people have believed in uh, different religions um, and so what I what I'm trying to get to here is then do you do you think that we need more um, of that type of promotion in sort of the broader public sphere because um, you know I I come across people all the time you know who who say to me well what does space have to do with me you know I'm down here on the earth minding my own business um, space doesn't involve me and it's so hard sometimes to try and I mean I'm getting better at it but it, it is hard to try and show people that this involves you that that space really does make a difference to your life and can do in in many many different ways and I think especially what with what you're doing you're opening up another door to how space can really affect someone's life down on the ground without even leaving the the bedroom or the house, as, as you just mentioned. Um, so, oh. so there's that, but then also just, just adding on to that as well, I'd like to know from you, sort of, do you, do you believe that space exploration is our destiny? Because that's one thing that I, I do believe in. I, I believe that, that we are here to do that, that that is our ultimate purpose, if you will. Um, so again, attached to that is, is those two questions. <laughs> so I, I largely agree uh, in the following way. Uh, I think that um, the universe, uh, we, we are all, of course, already in the universe. And, and even if people believe they are, have no connection to space, 
you, you need to make them aware that they are already in space. We, we are on a natural spaceship orbiting a, a, a sun, a star. And so uh, you, you cannot escape uh, the, this universe or the cosmos except by killing yourself or dying. So um, as at, at the species level, um, I do think uh, the cosmos is our destiny. And you, you see, um, what, what I think I'm about as a technologist and as an entrepreneur is the settling of two spaces, mm. outer space and inner space. Yeah. Because outer space is, is the physical, genuine, you know, the physical cosmos, but inner space is the metaverse, is virtual reality is the mind space and they are intimately interconnected they are uh, the a metaverse literally the word says itself it's a universe on top of a universe and so of course they are intimately connected and so i i believe and this is again uh this comes from carl sagan uh in on my facebook profile i have for for since 2008 or so, a banner that I created um, with the words from Carl Sagan that we are a way for the universe or for the cosmos, that's, that's his word, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. And that, that really is at the highest level what I think our the meaning of our existence is and the role, the... Uh, the purpose, the destiny of our existence, uh, and and this again, you can you can do this in 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 spirituality free terms, and you can do this even better in in uh, terms deeply uh, um, powered by by spirituality. So, I mean, it goes back to the Brahman idea of. The, the Godhead that disseminate itself into physicality, and then we are re-emerging, getting to know ourselves, uh, ourself again, and then we realize that we are as gods, and you know, while we're at it, we might as well get good at it and become uh, as, not as gods plural, but maybe eventually as uh, a single meta entity, a meta intelligence uh, group mind, a hive mind, by the way, a very sci-fi no uh, notion, um, but also a notion that is being worked on uh, the realization of which by means of mind uploading, for example, that's another thing that I'm into, uh, mind uploading. And it, it all ties together. Remember what I said about the convergence? So mind uploading ties into uh, group minds, uh, technically, and then group minds ties into the cosmos becoming alive and knowing itself and so that uh, i think is and and i also see metaverses as uh, being part of this process of self-awareness and self-realization of the cosmos uh, and getting to know ourselves and and realizing that not only are we off the cosmos but uh, if we allow this process to continue, we will become the cosmos in the sense that um, ultimately, if we convert all baryonic matter in the cosmos or most of it to so-called, this is another science fiction notion, computronium, which is smart matter, matter that is alive with intelligence and self-awareness and, and, uh, and all of that and sentience, um, if, if we convert... so. The, 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 the project of space exploration is but a first step. First you explore, then you settle, then you convert, ultimately, why would we go and settle the entire Milky Way and beyond? Well, if you see it in this extremely grand vision of the universe getting to know itself, the next step it will take eons, but the next step after settling outer space is to uh, increase the intelligence of matter, uh, of baryonic matter, and making 
uh, as much of matter as possible into thinking matter, smart matter. Uh, that's the, the notion of computronium. And so imagine an entire universe as we know it converted into thinking matter and you see the, how the mind uploading ties into the hive mind and the meta mind and the meta intelligence. So if an ever greater part of the universe becomes a meta mind, a single mind made up of zillions of individual minds that fuse with it, um, then you, you see how that would be a physical manifestation or realization of this idea of exitus reditus, Hegel, Brahman, and the, the pouring of the Godhead in, of itself into physical reality, and then the return, reintegration of that as a universe scale mind. Do you, do you see, so of course, the, another important question is, um, do you believe that there exists other species out there that are either below the same as or above our intelligence and in terms of the metaverse would that mean that if there's a a species out there that has progressed further in the endeavor of the metaverse um would they combine would that be possible to combine the two do you think at some point or we or 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 are we destined really to sort of have, I don't know, maybe species separate metaverses or what, what's your sort of stance on that type, that area? So fundamentally, I remember my agnosticism. Uh, on, on this point too, I unfortunately have no uh, confident statements to offer except a, a very confident doubt. <laughs> so, so I, I am very confident that um, that I don't know whether there are species uh, out there uh, that are at, below, or above our level of uh, civilizational development. I sure hope there are others. And if you look at the updates to the Drake equation, uh, the likelihood seems high. Um, and so in the sense that there was this, with regard to religion, you know, there probably is no God. Mm -hmm. I would say there probably are aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, but probably at this moment is, is as confident as we can say things because we have no evidence um, that is incontrovertible and 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 clearly legible to us at this moment of, of actual uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, um, I do think that what happened here on Earth, uh, which led to us, mm. is, is very likely extremely rare. Um, now, the universe is ginormous, uh, and even just the part that is visible to us. And we, we know that it's very likely that the part, the visible universe, is probably but a small part of a much larger uh, universe that continues. Its content is pr probably very similar to what we see in our, um, um, in, I mean, it stands to reason that it's more likely that the rest of the invisible universe is similar to the visible universe. Um, but we are not informationally connected to it, so we cannot confidently say that it is uh, like the visible universe. So the, the, even if the evolution of intelligent life as um, we know it here on uh, Earth is extremely rare, given the size of the visible universe and the likely size of the invisible, uh, the invisible universe beyond, invisible to us, um, I would be really surprised if there are no uh, alien extraterrestrial civilizations that, um, that are at our level and ahead of us uh, in terms of development. And I also, 
would be surprised if there have not been uh, a great number of civilizations that came and went already, and so that are not contemporaneous with us. And so I, that's, that's what I think is likely. Um, and then we can start talking about uh, unidentified aerial phenomena and, and stuff like that. We, I, I'm, I'm comfortable to go into that. But um, so I, I hope, uh, Cometan, that within my lifetime, which as a transhumanist, I hope to be very, very, very long, Yes. Uh, meaning many thousands of years, uh, literally. Um, I hope that within my lifetime, there will come a time where mankind makes first contact, indeed. And um, God, will that blow our minds. And, and I hope uh, we make contact with a species that is indeed well uh, ahead of us in terms of its development and not... Uh, indifferent to us in a positive way, um, and so uh, that is the, the, uh, what we, the best we can hope for is that there is a species out there that we get into contact with that uh, has a kind of a paternal, um, protective attitude towards fledgling new civilizations like ours, and and that. You know, and maybe the reason why we have not been contacted yet is for it's not in, it's not beyond the realm of the possible that we are in a kind of quarantine or in a special regimen where they leave us alone to develop um, by the lights of our own mind uh, or by 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 our own lights, and um, and that there is maybe this unwritten or written. <laughs> Uh, law in the cosmos where uh, you do not touch a civilization until they've reached a particular uh, marker of advancement. So, but th that could be, by the way, an explanation for why these, uh, if these UAPs or UFOs are not human in uh, nature, uh, that may be why they don't contact us and that might be why you know there, there are sporadic sam they do sporadic sampling to to check uh, the progress of our dna or or stuff like that i don't know i i really don't know but these things are plausible to me and so um and and you know and and it's important to have conversations about these things as well because you know I have conversations with people my fellow astronists uh, and you know the more times we think about this in a very deep way the more ideas that are produced and you know we were uh, thinking about something the other day uh, this idea of desolation that's what we call it in astronism which is basically the the, the proposition that there, ex there exists no other life in the universe um, and sort of the consequences of that are really interesting, but also scary as well at the same time. You know, um, the if it is true that, that the universe is desolate other than our planet or us, um, we have a big responsibility in many ways to fulfill uh, this, uh, especially what Carl Sagan said about, you know, knowing the cosmos and, and, and um, things like that. So that's, I think, really an interesting area to talk about. And um, also what I find interesting as well is this idea, in astronomy, we call it the scope window. Um, and it's essentially this idea that uh, we have really, as humans, um, it, essentially space exploration is not guaranteed, is, is the idea. And it's the idea that you know, we really do need to progress to certain levels, you know, in order to secure space exploration, that it's not something that is, that is, um, you know, guaranteed, essentially. So what is your sort of ideas about that? Because I know um, quite a few people uh, within sort of our communities, similar, I know Adriano Ortino thinks in, in this sort of way of, you know, we've got years left before we, uh, before this window of opportunity closes, um, and then we were going to be stuck here forever type of idea. 
So what is your position on, on that? I'm, I'm sorry for asking all these questions about your position and your beliefs, but it's just, it's just so interesting to me about how someone like yourself sort of understands these different um, concepts regarding space, essentially. <laughs> oh, I, I'm delighted to speak about this because it is of great interest to me as well. So um, I am fundamentally an, a cautious optimist and um, to a fault, um, I think we will, we have a good chance of surviving um, the, the, the great filters of civilizations. Um, is it guaranteed? Not at all. We can really um, come to an untimely death of the humankind and, and human species. Um, so with regard to the notion of desolation, I, the positive, the, the, the positive attitude that I have towards that is that it's fine either way. Uh, if, we, if we are alone uh, or if we are first in this universe, in this cosmos, um, then we have obviously an even greater responsibility and uh, to, to, to not die and to, to be the ones that are instrumental in helping the uplift the rest of the universe to sentience and to uh, computronium and to, and to coming to that point that uh, Carl Sagan so beautifully phrased as we are the cosmos. Uh, yeah, that's uh, our, our purpose is um, to be the, the ones that make the cosmos uh, to get to know itself. And so if we are not alone, which I think is the more likely, um, um, then it's still the same. Uh, but our role, but in that case, the cosmos doesn't depend just on us. The cosmos, uh, the, the cosmos has seen fit to put its eggs in a couple different baskets. Yeah. And so... And I think that's the more likely. Um, and so I, I do think um, with, and that this, this is circling back to um, what you said about things not being guaranteed. I do think that there are likely civilizations, intelligent civilizations out there that, um, that came and went already. And, and that is a partial explanation of the, uh, the, the Fermi paradox. And the great silence out there and is that we are not contemporaneous with other civilizations um, so th there is a great gulf separating us from other civilizations both in time and in space um, but if we're not alone then our importance and responsibility is a bit reduced uh, the entire cosmos doesn't depend on uh, uh, this upstart uh, civilization called humanity or humankind and so uh, but but either way um we we need to um be aware first of all we need to i think be viscerally aware of our how precious we are how precious uh mankind is how precious uh, planet Earth is, and we need to treat ourselves and planet Earth with far greater respect, self-respect, uh, because you know if you psycho, if you, if you, um, I don't want to pathologize it, but if you turn it into terms of psychopathology, uh, mankind is displaying symptoms of self-mutilation and and self hate and self-destruction and so we, we owe it to ourselves and the cosmos which is kind of interconnect or in deeply intertwined we, we are the cosmos uh, in a sense um, especially we are actually literally part of the cosmos by virtue of our atoms 
uh, having been forged in the bellies of uh, stars. So we, we literally are stardust. Another thing that Carl Sagan uh, was uh, keen to point out to us. So even if we live on a pale blue dot hanging in a beam of sunlight uh, in, in a solar system located in a unfashionable suburb of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, even if we are really remote and, and relatively, I think we are blessed to be in a quiet backwater of the universe because, you know, it's a shooting gallery out there. It's a violent universe and it seems to be uncaring about, uh, pr about life uh, or intelligent life. So, you know, the, the dinosaurs... Uh, most of them were uh, eradicated by a result of it still being a shooting gallery out there uh, with an asteroid, um, you know, wiping out so much of, um, of life on Earth uh, millions of years ago. And so, in summary, um, whether or not we are the first or the only ones, um, it, it, it's good either way whether we are alone or not. And, and we need to be deeply, keenly aware of our importance and how precious we are, how precious life is, how precious earth is, and not take anything for granted. Uh, we are not there yet. But you know, Kometan, there's also, I think we need to be gentle to ourselves and be kind to ourselves. I think it doesn't help us if we crush ourselves with the weight of having literally not the world on our shoulders but the entire cosmos on our shoulder so um mm, yeah i think it is more it, I, I i look if we if we mess up if we don't make it if we do not see our see ourselves past the great filters of civilizations if we blow ourselves up, if we kill ourselves, my sense is that, and this is cold comfort, but it's still some level of comfort, then I think that the universe, uh, as we know it, still has so many billions of years of existence ahead of it, that there will be another civilization somewhere else uh, in this uh, universe that will arise, and that may be more successful than us at uh, being a way for the cosmos to know itself. So I, yes, we need to be responsible. Yes, we need to not take things for granted. But at the same time, you know, let's not make things, let, let's not be too harsh and too hard on ourselves. Let's not take the cosmos uh, on our shoulders and Let's do our bit. Let's do the very best we can. And maybe, you know, the human race, we are animals, right? So we are a species of, of um, great apes that uh, used to live in trees and then descended onto the savanna and then spread out over planet Earth. And we are deeply tribal. And we, the, the veneer of civilization, even today, I mean, look at the resurgence of tribalism and uh, around the world politically um, and, and nativism and all of those uh, retrograde uh, developments. So the veneer of civilization uh, on top of mankind is still very, very thin. And so maybe the, the game is rigged from the get-go, maybe uh, we are so we, we are a species with uh, genetic uh, predispositions that really maybe we never had a chance. And so, uh, in that sense, I'm saying let's try to uh, rise to the challenge and and become one of the species or the species. Uh, to be a way for the universe to know itself. But, uh, you know, let's not crush ourselves with the weight of that uh, responsibility. Yeah, and I think it's about sort of that sort of being humble as well to know that, and, and this is ultimately with why astronism, why we've come to this consideration 
of I, I will view, which is cosmocentrism. Uh, this is why we've come to this conclusion. And this is why we see the world in this way, uh, the cosmocentric way, is because, yes, ultimately, we have to be humble to what is above us, what is uh, greater than us. And um, uh, sometimes we're criticized for being sort of anti-anthropocentric, so against humanity, but we're really not. We're just trying to put it into perspective uh, to say, you know, Yes, we could be important if we um, get to that state, if we get to um, reach other civilizations to compare our importance or whatever, you know, uh, but uh, ultimately we may not reach that. And I think we need to be humble about, um, about that. And also, yeah, like you said, you know, um, try our best. Uh, but don't kill ourselves in the process of trying to do our best, you know. Um, yes, please. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure how much longer you have to talk, but I just wanted uh, if one more question, if that's all right with you. Oh, go ahead. Um, no, no limitation. We can talk. We can continue for ages. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how long your typical episode goes for. It's usually around an hour, um, but, you know, we could extend it to an hour and a half. Uh, I don't like to go sort of over two hours because otherwise people start to sort of lose concentration and then they've had enough of space talk. <laughs> we, I'm sure we could go on forever. Um, but my, I hope we will. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but, not, um, but not in your episode. <laughs> um, but I, I suppose as well, another area as well that, that is sort of, interesting is um i suppose mars really if we, if we sort of bring it back to where we've gone so so far in our minds now to, you know to the edge of the universe and beyond and the future of humanity if we sort of bring it back down to sort of closer to earth and, and sort of look at mars now and think about where we're at with with um settlement possibly um and and what are, are you in the mo are you at the moment developing anything in terms of mars in terms of virtual reality if you can say what you're developing or, or not are, are you in, involved in projects related to mars essentially is my question uh yes i am involved uh with uh, in projects uh, related to mars yeah. Um, I am. I, I should be upfront here, and that I am at this particular moment more involved in projects relating to the moon and the settlement of the moon. Yeah. Um, so, but um, to take that to the higher level, um, I absolutely agree with Elon Musk that, and with Konstantin Tsiolkovsky that we need to leave our cradle of uh, beautiful, beautiful cradle of planet Earth and become a multi-planetary and ultimately, ultimately a multi-stellar uh, civilization, maybe in the very, very long, long, uh, long run, a multi-galactic uh, civilization. And so um, I am fully supportive of um, Musk's project and ambition for settling Mars. Mm. Um, I think it needs to be tried. Um, I also think that the moon needs to be settled. Um, I also think that the asteroid belt needs to be settled. Um, I think that the there it's more, it, it gets a bit more difficult, but I think humanity ultimately should settle everything that is settleable within reason in the solar system and then beyond. And so um, when it comes to what should be settled first, there, if you were to ask me, um, but I'm not Elon Musk, um, I would say that to the best of my understanding, the smartest way would be to first properly settle the moon yeah and um and and use that as a proving ground yeah. for the technology to settle mars 
And yeah. so, um, and, and I still think in that view of things um, that Elon Musk's SpaceX and uh, the, the Starship, et cetera, are also there the, the best available tools to settle the moon, uh, explore and settle the moon, and then explore and settle Mars. Um, so the moon and Mars are very inhospitable places to settle. And uh, yes, we can do in situ resource utilization. We will have to. We will have to live off the land. Um, but you know, the omnipresent hard space radiation uh, on the moon and on Mars, and so uh, terraforming the moon doesn't make sense because it's not big enough to hold its own atmosphere. Uh, terraforming Mars. Well, maybe uh, I, I'm I'm open there. Uh, so, because well, the, the problem is that it is on the small side, and that it has shown historically not to be great at um, because it also it doesn't have a, a magnetosphere, uh, and so it, it's not good at keeping whatever atmosphere we would build there. Uh, and so, but maybe we will become technologically so proficient that we figure out ways of giving Mars a, a, a human breathable atmosphere and keeping it long term and solving the magnetosphere, uh, the absence of a magnetosphere uh, to speak of. So what I do think in terms of near future uh, endeavors for the settling of near Earth space um, I think Venus is an overlooked uh, opportunity mm. and an, under, an underestimated opportunity. Venus is almost the same size as Earth. Um, Venus has a, a very dense atmosphere and Venus is the closest of all those planets to us, except for, well, the, the moon is not a planet, but so you know, it's, it's closer to us than Mars. And so um, I think a, a lot, lot more effort should go into the studying of Venus and the uh, attempts at settling, not by going and, 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 and building settlements on its surface, but by um, deploying uh, floating settlements in its upper atmosphere where if you calibrate things correctly, you can have uh, almost shirt sleeve environments uh, that with, with just an oxygen mask, you might be able to venture literally out of your, um, your air conditioned spacecraft uh, or space habitat. So I do think that Venus is a very promising target uh, for terraformation. Mm -hmm. So be, because in, in, within the case of Mars, terraforming means we need to add a lot. In the case of Venus, it is in some ways a simpler pro problem because there we need to subtract. We need to get rid of stuff. And so we need to get rid of the exceedingly um, runaway uh, greenhouse uh, effect that is going on uh, in the Venetian in the Venusian atmosphere, and so we need to find a way to have a like a, a plug where we can vent uh, all of that heat out into space and and maybe use it for for the terraformation uh, effort, um, but if we can. If we can find a way to vent the heat from uh, the Venusian atmosphere and maybe just let it go out to space um, and then bring it down to levels of pressure and temperature that are more, much more similar to Earth and then keep it there, uh, in terms of uh, 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 geoengineering, I think that's, that's a project that is is underfunded and an opportunity that we are not uh, seizing with both hands. I know it's less sexy uh, to think of uh, settling Venus uh, because for the foreseeable future, we will not 
see the day where we can go and, and walk around on the Venusian surface. Uh, but we could see the day of settlements uh, in the upper atmosphere of Venus. And I know that that is not, not as sexy as, as having actual settlement on the surface, uh, which is, I guess, why Mars is, is, more, is getting more dollars and, and, and being uh, more attractive as a target for, for settlement. But yeah, in a nutshell, well, not, not that small of a nutshell, that's my view with regard to near-term settlement of the, uh, the, the, the nearest space around us in, um, in the solar system. I, I think that as well, of course, there's, there's a lot of things taking place at the moment, isn't there? We've got uh, Richard Branson, who's just um, taken his space flight up uh, and then obviously come back down again after 19 minutes or something like that. Uh, we have governments sort of looking at each other, wondering which what they're going to do next. You've got China who's coming in uh, as the next big player. Uh, and also kind of Russia stepping back a little bit, uh, it seems, um, from the sort of forefront of, of space. And then Americans are sort of, again, kind of seem to be handing things more to Elon and, and some of these more independent uh, organizations. So in a way, this is a new space race. Um, and in a way, it's quite, it's quite worrying as well. Um, I'm concerned primarily because of my interest in human rights. I'm concerned about governments and also companies um, using labor that is not, um, you know, ethical, um, treating, you know, human beings <laughs> uh, not in the right way. So. Uh, I, I work in, at the moment, uh, what I'm really interested in is trying to develop sort of a, a better understanding of human rights in outer space. That's what I'm really interested in. Uh, that's where I think my research is taking me. Um, and so that's an area for me uh, that we can talk about more if, if that's what's interesting to you. But what is your sort of position on private, um, I, I, in a way, the commercialization of space? I mean, I know it's going to have to happen in order to, for space to, to really take off in the way that we envision it to. Um, but, you know, once let's say Elon gets to Mars and it all goes according to plan, there's so much gray area. I mean, what does he own? You know, all these types of things. Can he bring stuff back? And is that his SpaceX's? It, it's, it's, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And so that's what I kind of want to try and uh, add to um, and and it seems that sort of international law I mean there is space law of course that's still in its infancy but there's, there seems to be a lot that is still up in the air and I don't know if we have the time in a way to get these things in place because things seem to be moving so quite quickly quite quite quickly really um, what is your sort of view on all that, that area <laughs> in general? So um, a lot there and yeah. of great interest, of great interest to me as well. I think that if you look at, I, I believe to be and aspire to be a, a big history buff as well. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at uh, the, the big trends of humanity, what I suspect may happen with Mars, uh, if Elon's plans pan out in broad brushstrokes, the way he is painting his plans now, is that at some point there will be an American or a Martian revolution, uh, a, a Martian, th there will come a point where Mars, uh, just like uh, America before the American revolution, uh, where, where Mars doesn't want to pay any taxes anymore to Earth. And so th that will take some doing. B before Mars can be genuinely self-sufficient and 
uh, be able to continue living indefinitely, even if it were completely cut off from Earth, you know, that's not tomorrow. Mm. But uh, I do think that, that that is what Elon has in mind. And he's been careful, although arguably not careful enough, to, to, to not show his cards on that point. I fully believe, uh, understanding his uh, outlook on econ economics and, uh, and et cetera, I think that he wants to create a, an independent Martian city-state. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, well, maybe he will claim the entire planet if he's, uh, if he's the only one uh, out there, but, you know, uh, the, the nation of Elonia or Musconia uh, on Mars, I, I do think, and it makes sense. Um, I do, and I and I'm actually in favor of that. Uh, what I would not like uh, is that it is contentious, uh, or that it. I think it would be healthy that the settlers from Earth that go to Mars um, know from the get-go that this is what will happen sooner or later. Mars will become independent, yeah. self-sufficient, and its own country in its own nation state, et cetera, with its own taxation, et cetera, all of that. Yeah. But uh, wouldn't it be nice that we do this in an orderly manner without there being a, um, a bloody revolution as was the case in the American Revolution? How about Earth um, agrees in already from before even we, we have humans on Mars, we agree that at some point Mars will be uh, one or more independent nation states. Yeah. And, and we, we plan that in and we, we set out what are the criteria for that to happen. And then when we're there, when the criteria are met, uh, Mars or uh, city states on Mars become independent entities. Uh, I, I'm I'm in favor of that, and so and but the same on the moon, by the way. Um, now, how do we tie that back to the current uh, geopolitical situation? Um, yeah. I, I I think it I think the commercialization of space is is natural and the right way to go. Um, if you see how the approach by governments, uh, NASA, uh, has been slowing down uh, space exploration and space settlement enormously. Yes, you know, they, they, they are bureaucracies and they go slow, et cetera. Even there, they have problems like the, the, challenge, the Challenger that blew up, et cetera. So, um, the, the way to expedite things definitely is commercialization of space. A worrying development, of course, is the militarization of space. And uh, existing space law uh, sought to prevent that, but I don't think that's going to be successful. Uh, with the American Space Force, uh, we will see space forces in other countries. Um, I, I expect uh, China to, to announce a space force any day now. Uh, or, or soon. And so, uh, yes, China is, is rising very much and emergent as a major new uh, global power. And it is seeking, it's clearly seeking uh, hegemony. And um, if it plays its cards right, you know, especially with the turmoil, the internal turmoil and the division in the United States uh, in particular at the moment, you know, if China plays its card right, it can sidetrack the United States and thereby uh, much of the Western world. And I don't think China aims to become a world empire. Um, that's not in its DNA. Uh, I think China is interested in economically dominating the world in being the, 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 the head honcho and the, the 10 you know, the 10 pound gorilla or the 80 pound gorilla uh, in the room. Uh, and, it, and it has the makings of that. 
Um, but I don't think you know it will go and militarily conquer and colonize uh, other countries. It, it might for Taiwan, uh, but um, beyond Taiwan, I, I think I admire the Chinese, I have to say. I, I love everything Chinese except the CCP. And so um, uh, they are smarter than us Westerners uh, on average, um, uh, genetically, uh, etc. So, they, I think they will not, their calculation is that it's way too expensive and cumbersome to go and militarily occupy uh, the rest of the world or a significant part of it. Uh, I mean, the Romans tried that. And one of the reasons why the Roman Empire uh, met its uh, fate is because they spread themselves too thin. They had much too, their borders were far too big and the logistics, et cetera, of keeping those borders uh, impermeable, uh, they, the borders became permeable, uh, the, uh, the, the, the barbarians uh, came all the way to the, the, the gates of Rome, et cetera. So I, I think the Chinese are smarter than that and they will economically occupy the world or exploit it or dominate it, but not, not militarily. I could be wrong, uh, I hope I'm not wrong, but so, how do how does that relate back to space? It's clear, especially with the recent uh, 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 number of missions with the reestablishment of a space colony or a space station in orbit, um, China is going from strength to strength in space as well. And um, if uh, if Elon and uh, NASA don't hurry. Uh, with the Artemis uh, project, we might see a Chino-Russian uh, moon base and moon settlement before anything of significance uh, from the, the American and European side. Um, so, yeah, I, th they will be a, uh, a force to be reckoned with uh, in space, including militarily. Um, so they will... I don't think they will go and do a raid on the American or European uh, moon settlement or Mars settlement and, and go and militarily uh, conquer uh, um, settlements in space. I, I hope I'm not wrong about that, but uh, space will be weaponized and militarized. And so it, it will play a role uh, in how the the balancing of powers, geopolitical um, jockeying for for leadership and hegemony uh, will will play out on Earth. And so I, you know, is that a sad development? I don't know. I think it's it's kind of inevitable, given the uh, uh, history and predispositions of humans. Um, would I prefer that there would be a single world government and that there would, you know, that would I prefer the Westphalian nation state to be further eroded to the point where the globe, uh, just planet Earth, just becomes a, a patchwork of regions uh, with some autonomy, but basically uh, as one world government uh, under the UN or something? I think that would be better. Um, it's not perfect either, but I think it's better than what we have now. Um, at the same time, we, we need to be realistic. And I think, I hope and think that even if the Chinese become the dominant power, the, the new global superpower, even in that case, I think the overall purpose and destiny that we've discussed at the beginning of this conversation uh, of the realization of the settlement of outer space and the settlement of inner space, even in the case of uh, Chinese hegemony, I think that overall mission will survive that and that it will just be the Chinese who will preside over mankind becoming a way for the universe or the cosmos to know itself. And, and really, it, that in a way, there's quite a few things that, um, first of all, of course, I'm concerned that the Chinese, the, not the Chinese people, but the Chinese Communist Party will export 
their disregard really for various human rights treaties and conventions to outer space. That's my principal concern. And then obviously below that as well, another concern is, you know, that, um, but, it, but this has already begun, you know, the politicization of space, but that's already begun. We can't, we can't stop that now. Uh, but that is my principal, um, the, the, the human rights, you know, abuses, that, that is my principal concern with, with regards that's to China right. in space. Uh, but also um, it does make you wonder as well about um, whether we are ready, you know, it, it's, we were talking about this earlier, weren't we, about, you know, will we get there? You know, we're gonna try our best. And then when you look at the way the world is right now, uh, the way we are so divided in many ways still as a species, you know, um, it, may, it begs the question, doesn't it? Are we really ready? Um, are we really the right species to do this? Um, you know, it, it, those types of questions come back in, don't they? Um, and, you know, I think really, I mean, I don't know how much longer we've got to go, but um, to, to sort of round off this conversation, really, um, an idea that, that I think is both sad, but also still interesting to some degree is, the idea that we are, that I like to call the middle humanity. So, um, of course, humanity has explored the stars since prehistoric times for, through observation, of course, and then um, began to, you know, use instruments to um, expand on knowledge. Um, and we're at the position now where we know how vast the universe is, we know how fantastic it is, but we don't have the capacity to explore it. And so we're kind of this middle humanity where we don't get to enjoy the fruits of space that hopefully our future generations will be able to enjoy. But also at the same time, you know, um, we've sort of, we're not the first, you know, section of humanity to sort of uh, explore space sort of, visually you know so i think that's quite an interesting idea as well and is connected also to where we are right now um but for you philip what is your what are just some closing statements for you just around this conversation off about um your upcoming projects i, I suppose and and one thing i wanted to say as well quickly is hopefully philip will join us again for season three um, and uh, I'm hoping that he's going to show us some really interesting um, work that he's been doing. But just just give us a short overview of what you've got coming up. Okay, so a lot there. I'll try to be brief. I'll be happy to join you again in uh, the third season of your show. And um, I will, at that time, be able to share and show uh, a lot of the projects that we are working on right now, um, by that time, the metaverse that I'm building will be showable. And, um, and so that will be very exciting. I will also have uh, showable versions of uh, virtual reality projects that we are doing with regard to uh, the moon and the uh, virtual experiences, including uh, a... Um, an Apollo 11 landing uh, experience. So where you will stand uh, on the rim of a small crater on uh, what became Tranquility Base, and you will see the uh, Eagle uh, lander uh, lunar module descend to the lunar surface. And um, you will hear the conversation between um, Neil, uh, Buzz, and uh, Capcom in Houston. Uh, as they uh, approach and land on the moon. And then we will also have a, uh, a construction site for a lunar city um, uh, that will be so technically accurate that uh, after we've done it in virtual reality, we could use the, the 3D CAD models that we've de developed for it to do it actually on the moon. 
And so this will be an interesting uh, city. Um, it will be thousands of, it will be have a capacity of thousands of people there. Um, and um, it will be called Selene, which is the ancient Greek name of the goddess uh, of the moon in uh, ancient Greek mythology and, and lore. And um, it will be a city um, and in virtual reality, what we will be showing is the construction site for this uh, lunar city. And we will be showing how we were uh, a swarm of robots is excavating and digging a, a tunnel uh, inside the top of Malapert Mountain, Mons Malapert, which is the tallest uh, peak uh, of the south pole of the moon and probably one of the tallest mountains on the moon. And so one kilometer long tunnel uh, right under the, the top of uh, Malapert Mountain. And so those are some things that I will be very keen to share with you and to, uh, via screen sharing, uh, give you a kind of a, uh, an avant-premiere or a, uh, a walk around the construction side of these virtual reality experiences. Now, um, there was a lot more in what you mentioned. Um, so with regard to the... Um, uh, well, you were talking about the politicization, politicization of space and um, whether we are the right species, uh, are we ready, etc. Um, I, again, true to my uh, overall stance of agnosticism, I don't know. And, uh, and I don't claim to know, but we will, we will find out, we will find out. Yeah. And um, with regard to human rights, that was the other thing that you uh, broached. So I, I agree with your concern over what the Chinese, uh, or rather the CCP, is doing with the Uyghurs uh, um, in, uh, in China. And um, I don't see exactly what your worst case scenario is with uh, what you refer to as exporting human rights abuses to space. Um, I, I mean, eventually, could it happen? Yes, but given how precious uh, anything that you export to space, uh, any, any space settlement, you know, every kilogram or pound of material that you bring to Mars that is usable, uh, which includes the flesh of uh, living human beings, it will be for a long time, it will be so precious that I doubt that the CCP or anyone will want to do anything untowards in terms of rights uh, to, to human beings uh, in outer space. Now, also, I, I think history uh, is a, there are, it, history never repeats itself, but it does rhyme. And so, and so there, there are these pendulums that swing back and forth. And I think that with regard to tribalism and nativism and uh, populist uh, politics, et cetera, and, and swings to the right, we are seeing a pendulum that is going in that direction now, but we're probably already near the height of it and it will start swinging back toward uh, better politics. And I think the same will apply to China and, and to the CCP and to human rights uh, in, uh, in, in China. You see, re remember the Cold War uh, and the enmity between the United States and the West and, and Russia. So there is still an adversarial uh, relationship which, which heats up and cools down, etc. So there remains this competition, but the Russians are on the International Space Station still. They, they are leaving, but they, uh, they are still there. And so the co-opetition um, is possible. Uh, it is possible to work together and to compete with each other without killing each other and without um, without 
doing bad things. And so remember the, the song by Sting in the 80s, I hope the Russians love their children too. Um, well, I think the same applies now to the Chinese. And I, I, I would love for Sting to redo that song and, and sing, I hope the Chinese love their children. I hope the CCP loves its children too. Um, I've been married uh, and in a relationship with a native Russian for uh, over 20 years now. I've visited Russia many times and I can testify from personal experience, the Russians love their children too. <laughs> and, and so, and I've been to China as well. And my impression is that the Chinese love their children too. And so uh, I think that uh, China is on a, on a fast course of um, becoming a, a world player. And uh, again, they are not stupid. And so wh while they do uh, bristle at uh, foreign criticism of what they do inside of China, um, they, they know that they need to take care of their public relations and that they need to be perceived worldwide as a uh, as a fair uh, player and as a uh, you know to lead by example and uh, and suppressing peoples um, and and doing genocide or, or or worse or well is there worse than genocide but uh, do, doing such bad things is untenable and unsustainable in the long term uh, for the Chinese and so I think eventually th this may take time and and but I, I do think that will sort itself out yeah. and um if if china becomes the the new superpower i think you know nominally they may still ch uh, call themselves communism but already uh, if you look at the reality of china uh mm -hmm. it it is not it is not. It is a far cry from uh, Trotskyism or Marxist, uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, communism, and so I, I think it will be a kind of a hybrid between uh, Western uh, capitalism um, that is corrected uh, socially and environmentally uh, with some elements of, of of communism, I guess. So, but there again, and this is an, in an attempt to, to, to bring it back to the, the highest level here, mm -hmm. I th think there are trends that are converging. And the, I hope I'm not wrong, but the ultimate convergence point is this notion of Terre de Chardin, of noogenesis, the noosphere, and then the Christogenesis, the the emergence, uh, I see this entire process as not being dissimilar as that of a chrysalis, Comatan. Uh, so we are um, undergoing a continual, at times painful metamorphosis. We are becoming ever better and yeah. pushing and shoving. And, and sometimes, you know, it's two steps forwards and one step back. Sometimes it's three steps forward and five steps back. But um, at the larger uh, scale, at the higher level, we continue to progress towards this uh, theogenesis, to this becoming of uh, gods or godlike entity, a group intelligence, a meta mind of you know omniscience, omni, om, om, omnipresence, and uh, and eventually omnipotence. And so we, um, we are becoming as gods, and that's a, a fundamental tenet of transhumanists. Uh, and we, we, we might as well get good at it so that we really realize this notion of being a way for the cosmos to know itself. And with regard to your point about maybe we won't see the day ourselves, um, I wouldn't be too sure on that. I, um, as a transhumanist, I, by the way, transhumanism in my view, um, and uh, 
this is my definition of it, which has gotten some traction uh, in the transhumanist community. So transhumanism is a conviction. It's a movement that is driven by the conviction that science and technology can enable us to overcome human biological limitations, period. It's as simple as that. The, over, the transcending of human biological limitations in terms of our cognition, in terms of our health and longevity. So um, I mentioned earlier in our conversation, mind uploading. And, um, and so that is, uh, but life extension, healthy life extension is one of the aspirations of transhumanism. And so I'm not planning on dying. Uh, and I, I dearly hope, and I try to help as I may, that within my lifetime, uh, technology and science will advance to the point where I can extend my life in a healthy way from the four score years that uh, most of us are allocated, if we're lucky, to maybe 100 years or 150 years. And that by the time that I'm 150, technology will have advanced again to, to go beyond that. And so I, I think it is a reasonable expectation or hope uh, to think that science and technology may advance sufficiently to make that a reality. No guarantee, uh, but uh, the, the enormous advances in neuroscience and, and other sciences and the convergence of those sciences do uh, make espousing such a vision and a hope a position that is not unreasonable. Mm -hmm. um, so we will see, but I dearly hope that you and I and uh, your followers and uh, as many members of the human race will be still around hundreds and thousands of years from now to become ever greater um, cogs and wheels in this enormous cosmic machinery to bring us to the point of knowing ourselves. I do too. And what a brilliant way to end it as well. What a, what a fantastic conversation. Um, we'll have to think about uh, mind uploading as well. I'm really interested in that and trying to upload my mind, hopefully at some point in my future. Um, but thank you um, for your insight, your wisdom. Um, I, I really have enjoyed speaking to you today, Philip, and uh, I hope and of course, I'm sure that we'll, we'll see you again for season three and um, thank you everyone uh, who's, who's going to be watching this video in the, now and maybe uh, very far into the future as well, looking back at us, us two just talking about these things and yeah. looking back, what idiots, you know, they had no idea, <laughs> but it, it's interesting. And um, so thank you everyone. Uh, we'll end it there and I'll see you for season three.